Professor Olmeyer is Erasmus Smith Professor of Modern History at Trinity College Dublin and she is Chair of the Irish Research Council. Um, she is the founding head of the School of Histories and Humanities and Trinity's first Vice President for Global Relations. Jane's 13 edited and authored books uh, include The Cambridge History of Ireland um, and she's currently working on a book called Ireland Empire and the Early Modern World uh, and that's based on her 2021 Ford lectures and I, I'm sure that we will all look forward to seeing that coming out. Uh, she is a committed advocate and public commentator on the public humanities and contemporary issues and was director of Trinity's Long Room Hub Arts and Humanities Research Institute from 2015 to 2020. So as I say, it gives me great pleasure uh, to, to welcome Jane to uh, the room and to introduce her paper, which is entitled The English Empire in Early Modern Ireland. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, um, Alwyn. There's a little bit of feedback there, but I hope uh, now maybe it's sorted. Um, but Alwyn, uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, Bryony, Emma, Dom, and everyone associated with this conference, thank you very much. It's an absolute privilege uh, to be part of it. I've had um, uh, uh, the privilege of getting to know and work with uh, Bryony, Emma, and Dom in recent times, and uh, I'm really excited about the work that you're doing. I'm really sorry that I'm not there in person. I'm actually in California at the Huntington Library where I'm a visiting fellow, also speaking at a conference this weekend uh, on Ireland and the wider world. Um, but the upside of jet lag uh, means that I've been listening in to some of the papers, which really, I mean, they're absolutely excellent. And uh, uh, Nandi's poetry uh, reading just now, I mean, it was just so powerful. So uh, thank you to everybody for, you know, hanging in there, uh, joining uh, me, but, but also for the amazing conference you've already had. Lucy's going to help with the slides. I have quite a lot of slides. Um, uh, so um, if you hear me saying slide, it's simply because Lucy uh, very kindly is, is moving them on for me. Um, but let, let me cut, get, get, get started because I think, as we've already been very clear, discussions uh, of empire are very much of the moment. Uh, the decade of commemoration in Ireland, uh, combined with the recent uh, campaigns around uh, Black Lives Matter and Statues Must Fall, are really forcing a fundamental re-examination of our history and our relationship with empire. And of course, uh, empires and imperial frameworks, policies, practices and cultures have shaped the history of the world for the last uh, two millennia. It's nation states that are the blip on the historical horizon, even if uh, states, societies and monarchies had long existed within uh, empires. Slide please. Frederick uh, Engels, um, uh, writing to Karl Marx in 1856, observed, and I'm quoting here, Ireland may be regarded as the first English colony. Yet if um, early modern uh, Ireland was colonial, as it undoubtedly was, it also formed part of an integral part of the first English empire, and people from Ireland served as active imperialists across the English uh, and the other early modern European empires. So in my talk today, I, I want to explore how the global intersects with the local and the regional. Um, there are three parts. Uh, 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 the first, we'll look at how empires shaped the lives of uh, people living in early modern uh, Ireland. The second, we'll look at uh, how empires shaped the landscapes uh, in Ireland. And the third part will probe how empires shaped the mindsets and identities of uh, early modern people. And really, I am talking about um, people living in Ireland, uh, primarily in the uh, 17th and uh, early 18th century. And as I'm talking, I've drawn on a wide variety of historical, literary and archaeological sources. But given the theme of the conference, I, I really wanted to pay particular attention to material uh, culture. I'm also very keen to explore how contemporaries understood empire um, as experienced in Ireland, um, uh, but, but also, of course, the Irish uh, uh, globally. Um, now, as we talk about this, of course, we need to bear in mind that this was an age when few people left their parish 
and the opportunities to meet people from Asia, Africa and the Atlantic world were largely limited to those who traveled, served as sailors and soldiers or spent time in cosmopolitan centers like London, Amsterdam and Lisbon. There are, however, a handful of references to black people in 17th century Ireland. Next slide, please. In St. Mary's Church in Yole, the uh, uh, baptism uh, recorded, uh, uh, the, yes, there was a baptism recorded of David, um, formerly known as Lampo, and I'm quoting here, a Negro aged 15 years or thereabout, born in Montserrat, one of ye Caribbean islands. We've heard a lot about Montserrat today. The funeral uh, entry uh, that you see in front of you, or, uh, uh, it's an engraved, I mean, a, a drawing from the funeral entry for a woman called Lady Aaron. And you can see it includes a sketched image of a young black boy holding the train of his mistress at the wake of Lady Aaron in Dublin in 1669. Other evidence suggests that uh, 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 this could well be a black servant called Scipio, um, who was living at Kil uh, Kenny Castle in the service of Elizabeth, Duchess of Ormond, and she would have been the chief mourner at her daughter-in-law's uh, uh, funeral. Um, but aside from these very fleeting references to uh, Scipio and Lampo, they're lost from the records. However, Bill Hart has estimated that by the second half of the 18th century, between 1,000 and 2,000 black people, mostly male domestic servants and probably slaves, uh, lived scattered throughout the eastern half of Ireland, but predominantly in Dublin, also in Munster. While relatively few in number, the very presence of um, uh, 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 African people in uh, Ireland signals Ireland's engagement in early modern empires. And this then brings me to, if you want, part one, uh, uh, how empires shaped lives. Uh, next uh, slide, please. I think uh, Ireland's place in the early modern world is very well illustrated through an examination of the contents of a wash pit at Rathfarnham Castle, um, which was excavated in 2014 and unearthed a veritable treasure trove of 17 and a half thousand well-preserved artifacts dating from the second half of the 17th century. It provides this extraordinary uh, window uh, into elite uh, material culture, but it also highlights Ireland's global convergences. Next slide, please. Uh, built in the uh, 1580s by uh, Archbishop Adam Loftus, the first provost and founder of Trinity College Dublin, Rathfarnham Castle was typical of the fortified mansions constructed across early modern Ireland. Loftus was Protestant, well-connected and on the make, uh, and the Loftus family were amongst the thousands of New English settlers who colonised Ireland from the 1530s and made their fortunes in Ireland, often by dubious means, and I'll come back to them uh, uh, in a moment. Back to the Rathfarnham Horde. Next slide, please. As I say, it really provides a glimpse into the cosmopolitan material world, both public and private, of a planter dynasty and their household. It highlights the interconnectedness of the early modern world and how commercial activities of the English, the Spanish, at the Chinese and the Mughal empires extended to the periphery of Western Europe and how these activities um, uh, impacted on Ireland. And my rather crude map tries to sort of uh, 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 capture that uh, uh, visually. Next slide, please. The survival of coins, uh, trade tokens, where, uh, lead weights and wax seals tells a story of international commercial engagement Particularly noteworthy is a silver piece of eight mined and minted at Potosoy or Potosai in uh, Spanish Peru and dated uh, uh, 1655, along with a jetton struck at the end of the 16th century in Nuremberg, one of Europe's great centers of production. Uh, next slide, please. Smaller luxury items were recovered from the Rathfarnham wash pit, miniature glass figurines, probably from Nevers, France, and the Venetian island of Murano, and exquisite blue and white Chinese porcelain, along with uh, cruder Dutch and English copies. Um, the scale of the Rathfarnham find was exceptional, but the recovery of French, Portuguese, Dutch, German, English, and Spanish wares 
along with shards of Ming, um, uh, Chinese Ming uh, uh, pottery at Dunboy Castle in County Cork, once, once home to the great Gaelic Lord of Sullivan Bear, also testify uh, to wider connections. And we've so many examples uh, uh, from the archeological uh, uh, excavations, especially those conducted during the, the, the days of the Celtic tiger. Next slide, pl please. Um, extant fashion items were recovered at Rathfarnham, including uh, leather and wooden uh, shoe parts, heels, uppers, uh, soles and buckles. And worn down heels suggest that the shoes had multiple owners with mistresses passing on once precious pumps to their daughters and maids and fathers handing down their shoes to their sons and servants. Next slide, please. Though no textiles survived in the damp wash pit, archaeologists recovered wooden and metal buttons, pins and clasps, and these fastened undergarments, dresses and jackets, no doubt made from locally manufactured uh, woolens and linens, or maybe from exquisite silks and satins tailored in London, or colourful Indian calicos, which of course were at the height of fashion across Western Europe in the later decades of the 17th century. The discovery in an Ulster bog of clothing, an Irish mantle, an English doublet, and Highland tartan trues, along with leather uh, brogue shoes, uh, all dating from the turn of the 17th century, has also uh, prompted reflection on the relationship between clothing and colonial identities. And Audrey uh, Horning has a wonderful article on, uh, on this. Next slide, please. Unsurprisingly, uh, no bulky uh, household uh, furnishings found their way into the wash pit, um, while other very highly prized possessions, things like elaborate wall hangings or uh, uh, bed covers or turkey carpets, uh, which were so common in the inventories of other grand houses, uh, presumably these perished, they certainly uh, uh, weren't found at the Farnham, but we know from other sources, uh, as I say, the inventories that they're there, but also that Irish people abroad constantly sent home exotic gifts. For example, in 1675, Gerald Anger, who was the governor of Bombay and Surat in India, sent his brother uh, uh, an Indian tent made of Indian calico. And one can begin to imagine how exquisite gifts such as these uh, delighted the grandees of Dublin and the locals of rural Longford, where the family uh, seat was. What you have on the slide is an example of just how uh, magnificent uh, uh, these uh, Indian uh, tents, but more generally the textiles uh, were. Next slide, please. Extant ceramics excavated at Rath Farnham and other sites highlight how members of the elite cape, uh, kept up with the latest trends, drinking tea from Asia, albeit later 17th century, um, uh, uh, and they always drank their tea from Chinese porcelain cups and saucers, or the elite did. Uh, their coffee it came from the Yemen in the Middle East. Um, uh, and, and what you have in front of you, though it dates from a slightly uh, later period, is the Armorial China, um, uh, commissioned in 1722 by Sir Robert Cowan during his time in Bombay. You, you see him in his wonderful pink banyan. The service took three years to arrive, but it is extant in the family home at Mount Stewart in, in County Down. Next slide, uh, please. Scientific analysis of the food uh, remains in the, Rathvorn, Rath, the, sorry, the Rathvarnum wash pit, especially bones, shells, seeds and nuts, together with other research led by Susan Flavin as part of her wonderful ERC food cult project, provides fascinating insights into everyday diet as well as insights into cultural identities. And so, of course, what we have here is a whole range of foodstuffs coming from the New World as part of the Colombian exchange, as it's, it's called. It often comes uh, to Ireland via Iberia. Um, uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's extremely extensive and includes marrows, peppers, uh, numerous types of beans, turkeys, potatoes, uh, 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 and a host of other uh, items. And I think it's important to reflect how, how imperialism played a significant role in shaping the culinary history uh, of Ireland. Um, uh, next slide, please. I, I have to say something about uh, uh, the potato because of course, potatoes uh, were indigenous to the Andes 
um, and held to have aphrodisiac uh, qualities. They probably came to Ireland via Spain and not with Sir Walter Raleigh as the myth has it. Uh, and they probably came during the first decade um, of the 17th century. And within 50 years, potato growing was reasonably widespread, but initially it remained a luxury food. There's a wonderful recipe from the 1660s for potato pie in the recipe book of uh, Dorothy Parsons from Burke Castle, which involves lots of sugar, dried fruits, rose water and spices, especially cinnamon. Um, it really was the world in a potato pie. But what we find is towards the end of the 17th century, potatoes really had become an important part of the diet of the rural uh, uh, poor. Next slide, please. The discovery of a large number of clay pipes at Rathfarnham Castle and in other archaeological digs around Ireland suggests that tobacco smoking proved a particularly popular pastime. And again, research by Susan Flavin and her team on human remains from this period has shown how teeth were worn down from chewing uh, the tobacco pipe. Uh, tobacco was, of course, native to the Americas and by the 1610s and 20s was widely used in Ireland and elsewhere. And some, including King James VI and I, abhorred the habit, while English and Irish language writers uh, ridiculed the obsession uh, 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 with uh, tobacco. And I think it's really with tobacco and sugar that we see uh, the most, I mean, the, 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 between the two, uh, they, 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 they have a very profound impact um, uh, on, on ordinary people. But I want to turn now to shaping landscapes. Um, it's very important to uh, bear in mind that the Irish economy was subservient to that of uh, the English economy. So we're dealing here with, uh, you know, obviously economic imperialism, yet Dublin nonetheless thrives during these years and of course goes on to become the second city of empire. And over the course of the 17th century, at uh, Galway, Limerick, Kinsale, York, sorry, yeah, Cork, Yall and Waterford all prosper on the back of trade, um, uh, really the provisioning trade uh, to the Caribbean. Uh, by the 18th century, uh, Cork predominated, while Waterford had become the centre of Irish provisioning for Newfoundland and Belfast for the linen trade. Next a slide, please. But more generally, colonial enterprise beginning uh, with the plantations of the 16th and 17th century, shown here on the map, transformed the Irish uh, landscape. We see during these years a frenzied program of building castles, mansions, schools, churches, jails, roads and bridges, together with the clearing and enclosure and drainage of land and the planting of orchards and gardens. I mean, the, the countryside, the landscape is really transformed uh, and results in new patterns of rural nucleated settlements and the emergence of major urban ones. This urbanization and the proto-industry uh, associated with these years, along with the demand for timber, resulted in extensive deforestation. Uh, and of course, it's no, consist uh, no coincidence that uh, wolves, for example, were reduced to extinction in Ireland by the middle of the 17th century. And that environmental uh, history of um, the plantation is really being uh, told, somebody like Keith uh, Blummer's work, but also the work of um, uh, Francis Ludlow, very important here. Uh, next slide, please. And this uh, uh, map draws on, on some of my own work on the uh, Irish aristocracy, because we see grand fortified English style uh, mansion houses like Rathfarnham Castle, um, uh, uh, literally mushrooming up across Ireland, often boasting walled gardens, orchards, bowling greens, and even tennis courts. Um, small communities comprised of agricultural workers, traders and craftsmen, often settled close to these big houses or populated villages or towns nearby where the local Lord helped to fund the building of a market square, courthouse, uh, uh, church and school. Um, now, what I have done on the map is, is simply uh, put on the big houses built by Irish peers, in other words, people who hold a title during the 17th century. And you can see obviously the concentration in Mul uh, Ulster uh, and Munster, but this is only the tip uh, uh, of the iceberg of the construction associated uh, with the plantation, uh, commercialization and consumerism 
uh, of uh, uh, the 17th century. Next slide, please. Uh, just a few examples of these big houses. You've seen um, Rathfarnham, but we have the Earl of Cork, built Lismore uh, in County Waterford, but also Castle Lyons and Grand Mansions at Yall and Bandon in County Cork. The Earl of Tanricard spent £10,000. £10,000 was a small fortune uh, 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 in the early modern period uh, on a grand fortified house with mullioned bay windows and an, uh, an ornate interior at Pertumna near County Galway. Now, these houses transformed the physical landscape and stood as powerful testaments to the civility of their owners in the privileged position of these uh, power brokers. Little wonder then that the insurgents, um, when war broke out in 1641, targeted for destruction these fortified mansions as uh, symbols of um, uh, uh, Anglicization. Uh, that said, uh, uh, property destroyed or damaged during the 1640s was often rebuilt after the restoration. Next slide, please. I want to now shift gear and ask about what um, then of those who uh, made good on the back of empire, whether in the Atlantic or uh, in India, and reinvested their wealth uh, back in Ireland. Uh, many who migrated stayed in close touch with their families and uh, sent home exotic gifts and luxurious uh, 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 goods. Others clearly had an ambition to return home to purchase property and to invest their profits in securing higher social uh, status. And we see this very clearly in the case of Gerald Anger. He'd made um, a fortune during his years as the president of Bombay and Surat, and he supplied his brother, the Earl of Longford, with much needed capital for his business as a property developer in Restoration Dublin, and especially for the development of the city's first suburb around Anger Street, which of course today is a very busy uh, a thoroughfare. Um, now, it's in desperate need of renovation. But number nine, Anger Street, which is what you see in the uh, slide, is the only one of these 17th century houses uh, uh, to survive. Uh, uh, so the next time you're um, uh, uh, walking down Anger Street, uh, you know, you can uh, remember, and it's so hard to guess because of the uh, 19th century facades, but it's actually a 17th century street built on the back of Indian uh, 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 money and treasure remitted from India. Next slide, please. In his recent monograph, Andrew McKillop, uh, identified 68 estates in Ireland, uh, mostly in Ulster and Leinster, but with a concentration around Cork City, bought with the profits um, uh, made from service in Asia. Now, he suggests that the figure is low, especially when compared to Scotland, but will increase when scholars gain full access to landed records in the Registry of Deeds in Dublin, something that he and Patrick Walsh, and I'm not sure if Patrick's in the audience, he can talk to this better than I, but, but he and, and Andrew McKillop are, are, are working on this. Next slide, please. Drawing on a vast and largely untapped archive in the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, Edward Teggan's doctoral thesis recovers the career of Sir Robert Cowan. You saw him earlier in this pink banyan, but his Indian fortune of, of roughly £20,000 bought an estate in Ulster for his nephew, the first Marquess of Londonderry, and it is, of course, Mount Stewart, though it was originally called Mount Pleasant. The son of a planter and originally from Derry, uh, Cowan spent his early years in Lisbon and this together with his Presbyterian associations helped him to secure favour and office in the East India Company serving as governor of Bombay um, and his Indian diamonds known as the down diamonds of, uh, were made uh, in, in the 19th century into this uh, very um, uh, ornate uh, tiara which is on display in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Next slide please. Um, others made their money um, in the Caribbean. The Browns of Westport House in County Mayo are a well-documented example. Um, in 1752, Peter Brown married Elizabeth uh, Kelly, heiress of Dennis, owner of uh, Jamaican plantations and 360 slaves. Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth's grandfather, Edmund Kelly, of Lissa Duff in County Galway had become uh, the Attorney General of Jamaica in the 1720s and in the 1740s his son Dennis, or Jamaica Kelly as he's known, was appointed a Chief, Dusta, Chief Justice. And by this point the Kelly family owned an estate that ran from north uh, uh, to the south of the island and Kelly's daughter and heiress married then the once Catholic, now Protestant, Brown family of Mayo. And the Browns uh, thus became Ireland's premier absentee plantation owners 
in the Caribbean. And we see how profits made in the new world allowed for the transformation of the old world uh, family seat at Westport. Similarly, Fanula O'Kane has recovered the stories of the Latouches of Frith Varnum in Jamaica. Uh, and I would encourage you to look at her work. Next slide, please. But what of Irish Catholics who, uh, because of penal legislation, were unable to translate their wealth into landed estates in Ireland? I'm particularly interested in the Caribbean where Irish Catholics formed a considerable uh, proportion of the white population, especially in the English, but also in the Danish, as we heard earlier from Laura, uh, the Danish empire, but also the French and the Spanish empire. From the 1620s, uh, many had moved, and of course, many of them involuntary, and others as indentured servants to the Caribbean, where a minority made good on the back of sugar and slaves. Anecdotal evidence suggests that these men educated their children in Catholic Europe, but then brought property and sought brides in England, um, uh, while also retaining uh, strong links uh, to Ireland. I'll give you an example here. Um, uh, next slide, uh, please. Um, the testamentary evidence reveals these very complex Atlantic networks and highlights the importance of money, usually made in the Caribbean, being remitted back to Ireland uh, by Irish Catholics. So, for example, in 1687, Anthony French's will included significant legacies for his brother in uh, Dublin, his aunt Sabella and her children in Galway, his primary heir and, uh, uh, and his nephew, John uh, French Lynch of Surrey, uh, died the following year, but actually um, uh, uh, John uh, had a huge uh, plantation in St. Christopher's, St. Kitts, and his will, he, he makes a whole raft of bequests to his friends in England, uh, London, Surrey and Bath, in France, it, to, 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 to family in Nantes. Remember, Nantes is the major uh, uh, slave trading uh, centre uh, for the Atlantic world, uh, the Caribbean, uh, St. Kitts and Antigua. Uh, also to family in the East Indies, in other words, in India, Madeira, and in Ireland. So you really need to get your head. I mean, the, the, these, these networks are very, very extensive. Um, uh, he also had some property in Ireland, which he, he left to his Irish uh, uh, kin. Um, but his main plantations in St. Kitts, along with, I'm quoting here, all my Negroes, stock and utensils, passed to another uh, nephew. Now, the story of how this wealth, albeit spread over multiple locations and in relatively small amounts, uh, but added up over time, how this impacted on Catholic Ireland and especially the merchant communities remains to be told. Um, I'd like to use it, just tell you, share with you another example, that of Sir William Stapleton. Um, uh, 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 he and his associates in the Leeward Islands um, were Catholic, but they used every opportunity, whether it was marriage, education, and social interactions, to make themselves English. And they do so without comprising, uh, compromising their religion uh, or their association uh, uh, with Ireland. Nicholas Chute, who um, we heard about earlier, of course, he did make his fortune in the Danish colony of St. Croix, but he was then very quick to settle in London. Um, when he died in 1672, Chute left, and I'm quoting here, sundry lands, plantations, and Negroes, worth a very considerable amount, to his son, wife, and daughters, who were now settled in England. But the surnames of their husbands, Stapleton and McCarthy, suggests that at least two of the daughters married into Irish families. And Chute also remembered in his will his kinswomen in Ireland, um, and uh, Mary Cahill, uh, Anne McNamara, and Biddy Riley. So again, very strong Irish associations. Writing in 1655, Henry Cromwell, son of Oliver, who served as the governor of Ireland during the 1650s, maintained that the transportation of Irish, the Irish to the Caribbean would turn them into Englishmen. And to some extent, this did ring true uh, for the Chutes and the Stapletons, but they didn't, as I say, uh, 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 compromise uh, uh, their faith. Now, identity formation, as we all know, is notoriously complex, but I think it is also worth noting that Englishness was something that members of the elite in Ireland also vied to acquire as they married English women, bought English property and sought favour at court and fortunes uh, uh, in London. I want to now turn from landed uh, from land and and and, and trans, uh, sort of uh, wealth 
um, movable wealth, to think about the imprint of uh, uh, empire in a slightly different way, uh, and to talk a little bit about Sir Hans Sloan. If we could have the next slide, please. So Sir Hans Sloan, as uh, you probably know, was the uh, counting down doctor, collector, and uh, naturalist whose uh, collections served as the founding ones for the British Museum, the Natural History Museum, and the British Library. And Sloan also made his fortune in empire. Closely associated with Scottish planters, the Hamiltons of Clandy Boy and Clan Brassel, and later Dufferin, um, uh, uh, Annie, of course, was talking about the Dufferins, uh, uh, or about Dufferin. Uh, Sloan was born in Killy in 1660, where he developed a colonial and improving mindset, as well as a passion for the local flora and fauna, before moving to London, where Robert Boyle mentored him. During the 1680s, Sloan travelled to the Caribbean as the personal physician to the second Duke of uh, Albemarle, and in Jamaica, he met his wife and heiress to a sugar plantation. The wealth that made possible Sloan's collecting derived from this plantation and investments Sloan made in the Royal Africa Company and the South Sea Company, both of course engaged in the slave trade. According to his biographer, James uh, Del uh, Burgo, and I'm quoting here, Sloan's legacy is an artifact of British imperial power. Though there is no uh, record of how Sloan self-identified. His librarian, Thomas Stack, boasted in 1728 at the height of Sloan's influence in London, and I'm quoting, what glory for Ireland to see one of its sons so crowned. Over the course of his life, Sloan enjoyed deep ties to Ireland, illustrated by his lifelong uh, friendship with Sir Arthur Rawdon, who lived in Moira, not far from Killyleigh in County Down. Like Sloan, Rawdon was a passionate collector. On the foot of Sloan's trip, uh, when he'd identified over 800 species, uh, uh, Rawdon asked his gardener, James Harlow, to bring plants from Jamaica. And in May 1692, Harlow arrived in Carrickfergus with 20 cases, each containing over 50 healthy uh, trees, shrubs, and plants. And in a hothouse, probably similar to the one in the Physic Garden in Chelsea in London, Rawdon cultivated his flora, including cacao. He supplied uh, uh, Sloan with plants and exchanged, exchanged others with botanic gardens and collectors across Europe and Britain. So Amsterdam, Leiden, Leipzig, London, Oxford and Uppsala. On Sir Arthur's premature death, his son, who also died young, and his daughter continued to correspond with Sloan and helped Trinity College Dublin to establish its physic garden with gifts of plants. Uh, so. I mean, but then with their passing, the gardens at Moira, uh, a nursery of imperial plants fell into disrepair. And if you go today, there's absolutely uh, no indication uh, of, 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 what, of what there was. Um, so I'm gonna turn now to the third part of my, of my talk, which really is uh, uh, shaping minds and, and continuing to reflect a little bit on identity. And again, just to remind uh, uh, you that this is an age where people rarely traveled outside of their locality. Uh, so how then did ideas about empire shape the minds of people living in early modern Ireland? A real absence of evidence makes it impossible to determine how the consumption of tobacco and sugar and spices or the wearing of calicos invited reflection on the provenance of these foodstuffs or fashion items. However, for members of the elite, we, we do have um, uh, uh, other ways of trying to probe this. Next slide, please. Maps were hugely important. Uh, maps and actually travel literature uh, uh, framed engagement and perceptions of empire, as of course did prose and plays, and I'll come back to those in a moment. Household inventories, uh, library and auction catalogues show that maps and globes were prized possessions in the homes of the elite across Ireland. And by the turn of the 17th century, um, often illustrated with uh, representations of indigenous peoples, including uh, uh, those by the likes of John Speed, uh, these circulated very, very widely and fired imaginations about the exotic. They also captured colonial knowledge by offering visual proof of dominance, the fortifications and walled towns, while also functioning as a tool to shape or to manipulate popular perception. Of course, these images also uh, ha had a particular uh, a significant uh, ideological component that presented subtle messages concerning the civility of colonial uh, uh, subjects. 
next slide please. Books uh, like Richard Hacklop's The Principal Navigations, along with many, many others appear to have circulated uh, very widely in Ireland and literally brought the world into the hands of readers. We have extant library uh, catalogues from Ireland's early modern libraries, Trinity, Marshes, the Bolton Library, which is now in Limerick, all demonstrate that Irish readers had access uh, to this travel literature, which is published all over Europe. Uh, 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 and, and not just in, in the original language, but also um, the uh, uh, English translations. And as I say, it's a truly global body of literature connecting readers to the debates and discussions regarding the exploration. And of course, the exploitation taking place in Asia, the Americas and the Caribbean. The coverage was also diverse um, and it covers everything sort of from topography, uh, linguistics, zoology. Uh, uh, there's particular interest in practical usage of commodities like spices, uh, tobacco, tea, sugar uh, uh, and chocolate. And you have very vivid stories of the lives, customs and practices of indigenous peoples and accounts of tropical flora and exotic animals. Um, and, and you can really begin to imagine how this excited intellects and triggered uh, curiosity and this literature, this travel literature, then, of course, informed the, 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 the creative writers of the day. Uh, and I just want to talk about one particular work that I think is very interesting and very important. And next slide, please. It's Afra Ben's Orinoco, um, or The Royal Slave, published in 1688, the year before she died. And it presents an insightful account of slavery and plantation in the early modern world, even if Ben's focus is on the individual tragedy of an African prince rather than the practice of slavery. Um, it's the story of uh, Orinoco and Imoinda, um, his uh, a great, the great love of his life. Um, uh, but Orinoco's grandfather, who was the king of uh, Coromantane, sells Imoinda into slavery and shortly afterwards English traders enslave Orinoco himself. He's shipped to Suriname, which was then an English and later a Dutch colony in the northeast tip of Latin America, where Orinoco meets the narrator of the novel, who is the daughter of Suriname's Governor Bynum. Um, uh, there he is serendipitously uh, reunited with Imoinda, um, and it's widely believed that uh, Ben visited uh, or had visited Suriname uh, and when she would have visited, uh, it was a colony of 800 uh, white settlers, two and a half thousand African slaves and 500 uh, Indian uh, slaves. So there's, uh, you know, a chance that she witnessed firsthand the sugar plantations that depended on slave labor. Next slide, please. Even though Orinoco is a work of fiction, um, uh, uh, as I've just suggested, it, it suggests, uh, it, you know, it could, it, it's clearly based on real events and real people, including William Bynum. And um, Ben borrows from uh, a variety of contemporary na uh, travel narratives using to great effect ethnographic descriptions and graphic details, such as the description of Pepper being rubbed into Orinoco's wounds after he's been whipped. Uh, the novel ends when Orinoco, or Caesar, as he is now known, uh, leads a rebellion of the African and Indian slaves. Um, and it's interesting that it's a wild Irishman called Bannister that kills him by burning him alive, having brutally dismembered him. Uh, first his nose, ears, then his arms. It's really it was the public punishment for, for slaves who rebelled. Now, this was probably a reference to Major James Bannister, who's a thuggish figure who was responsible after 1667 um, uh, for evacuating uh, English colonists uh, from uh, uh, Suriname and resettling them in, in Jamaica. Uh, but the fact that Ben calls Bannister a wild Irishman is interesting, since other sources are silent on his background. Um, in, in a fascinating article, the literary scholar Lee Morrissey seizes on this mention of Bannister to situate Orinoco in the context of colonial Ireland and to link his violent death to the execution of Charles I. Bannister is both a wild Irishman, but also a Protestant merchant adventurer. Moreover, Bannister is white, something that Orinoco uh, calls out with his dying breath. Next slide, please. For, th for the narrator and Afra Ben herself, Orinoco was not a rebellious slave, but a handsome hero of great wit, learning, courage and honour. 
And this is picked up by the Dublin dramatist and Trinity student Thomas Southern, when in 1696 he transforms Ben's Orinoco into a popular tragedy. The play was broadly in line with Ben's novel, except that Imoinda was white, and the play ends when Orinoco, not a wild Irishman, kills his pregnant wife and then himself. The play was a huge hit in London and in Dublin, and there were regular and at times annual performances of it at one of the Dublin theatres from 1699 right through until the late 1750s. Thus, Orinoco's strong anti-slavery message helped generations to question slavery decades before abolitionism took place. And it also fell to an Irish playwright to celebrate the marriage, intimacy and love between a white woman and a black man. Given how rare these sorts of unions would have been, no doubt Southern sought to titillate and fire imaginations, or he might have been alluding to the marriage across religious boundaries or the marriages across religious boundaries uh, so common in early modern Ireland. That Southern conveniently removed Bannister and downplayed then aggressive colonialism and ethno ethnocentricity uh, is also intriguing uh, in what it has to say about Irishness and, and whiteness and uh, uh, colonialism. So I want to draw things to a close now and, and conclude by reflecting on, if you want, the legacy of empire in early modern Ireland um, and how it's remembered uh, uh, today. Next slide, please. And how myths and uh, memories associated uh, with events that occurred in the 16th and the 17th century, the Protestant Reformation, the plantations, the 1641 rebellion, the Cromwellian conquest, the siege of Derry, or the Battle of the Boyne, which remain so much a part of the DNA of Irish people and are so core to the identity of some people living uh, on the island. So images like the ones uh, uh, on the slide, I think, illustrate this. Um, so uh, uh, it's, on, it's on the right hand side, my right hand side, but you see the um, drownings of uh, Protestant settlers at Portadown Bridge in the aftermath of the 1641 rebellion. Uh, now, it's obviously from a pamphlet dating from 1642, but you also can then see the banner from a local uh, Orange Lodge, uh, which depicts um, uh, 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 the drowning. Um, uh, there's a mural um, of Cromwell's revenge for 1641. So that mural uh, was on the lower shankle. I don't, I, I don't think it's still there, um, but, and you can't read it, but it's basically saying, you know, revenge for 1641. And again, is the uh, subject of another uh, banner. Now I'm so conscious that Dom is around and he, he really is the expert here, but, but I, I think, uh, you know, as we have this conversation between the past and the present, it's, it's interesting that the early modern period is, is so key or was so key uh, uh, to identity. And of course, sensitivities also remain around nomenclature. It's already come up uh, throughout the conference. Uh, the use of the word colony uh, became very politicized uh, during uh, the Northern Ireland Troubles, as did discussions around Ireland's involvement in the British Empire and the extent to which the Republic of Ireland was post-colonial and Northern Ireland uh, uh, colonial. So like it or not, uh, uh, empire and colonialism has profoundly impacted Ireland and the Irish uh, as it has at so many other places. Whereas John Darwin, one of the most influential historians of the British Empire put it, uh, and I'm quoting here, the world we live in uh, uh, was so largely made uh, by empires and not uh, just uh, those of the Europeans that to, to, that to deny their influence is merely futile. And similarly, in a collection of essays entitled Imperial Debris, and Laura Stoller examines, and I'm quoting again, how colonial situations bear on the present and how these histories, despite having been so concertedly effaced, yield new damages and renewed disparities. Final slide, please. Of course, all of these discussions are very politically charged at the moment, uh, especially uh, in the US and the UK. But uh, Priya Satya uh, has suggested in Times Monster uh, that the UK's culture wars and the campaigns connected to Black Lives Matter will, and I'm quoting here, change popular views of colonialism. And as part of uh, other programs focused on reparations, repatriation and restitution will help to decolonize uh, institutions. Um, I hope she's right. 
uh, I, I suppose I would say, though, that definitely these initiatives have found their mark in Ireland. And I think Ireland, and here when I say Ireland, I, I suppose I'm really talking about the Republic of Ireland, where um, uh, we are, I think, beginning to come uh, to terms with our uh, uh, imperial legacy. And um, obviously there are discussions ongoing about how to decolonize Irish history. I've People have seen the most recent issue of Irish Historical Studies, um, uh, initiatives about how best to engage with colonial uh, legacies in our universities and cultural institutions. And we've heard so much uh, about these uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, two days. And I think actually this conference itself uh, and the wonderful research project that underpins it really is an example of best practice. And I just want to pick up, uh, to, uh, Bryony, earlier you apologised um, for things that you know we haven't got right. But I just want to finish by invoking Beckett. Uh, and, and as Beckett said, you know, uh, uh, try harder, fail better. It's just so important uh, to keep on having these conversations uh, and, and, and to do this empirical research and to do it in a very non-judgmental way. Uh, and then we can actually have an informed discussion. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention.